So we're going to move on from the idea of the electron being a special particle that Bohr proposed to looking at exactly what kind of particle the electron is. Based on Planck's and Einstein's discovery that light can have both the wave property and can behave like a particle. What about something that is classically a particle behaving like a wave? And this was first proposed by Louis de Broglie. The electron, which is the classical particle, should also be able to behave like a wave and of course the proof of this is that you have to be able to measure the wavelength of the electron based on the calculation of energy of the photon which is hc over lambda and relating that to Einstein's famous equation e equals mc square and de Broglie derived an equation it's often called the de Broglie wavelength so you have a classical particle like an electron it has a certain mass and v here is velocity not frequency and you can calculate the wavelength using de Broglie's equations. So this problem illustrates illustrates how to use the de Broglie wavelength equation. This particular example talks about a very fast ball that was hit by Andy Roddick, who used to be one of the fastest server in US tennis. And one of his fastest serves is recorded at 155 miles per hour. And so given that we have the weight of a tennis ball, what's the wavelength of that ball that Roddick served? To calculate it, you just need to plug it into the de Broglie wavelength equation, which is lambda equals h over mv. This is not new, by the way, it's V, velocity. And H, of course, is Planck's constant. However, I do want to point out that for this type of problem, you want to remember that joule, which is in the unit of Planck's constant, is the same as kilogram meter squared per second squared. The reason that becomes useful is because you want to cancel some of these units with the denominator unit of mass and velocity. So if I write it as kilogram meter squared per second squared, I can cancel the kilogram with the kilogram at the bottom, and of course, what I've done there is convert the mass to kilogram instead of the unit that was given, which is in grams. So I'm going to convert that miles and hour to meters per second. And then once I have that, one of those seconds is going to cancel out with this other second. And then the meter is going to cancel out with one of these meters, leaving us at the end, as you can see, with one unit left, which is meter. And of course, that's the unit of wavelength. You're going to get 1.69 times negative 34 meter. So the question also said, calculate the wavelength of an electron that's also moving at that same speed. The only difference that you'll see here is that the electron has a much smaller mass compared to the tennis ball, which is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So everything else is the same in the denominator. What we get if we do that calculation is 1.05 times 10 to the minus 5 meter. Now, both of these numbers are small numbers, but the key here is to note that the wavelength for the tennis ball in this case is very, very short. It's so short that that this is not a value that you can observe with any instrument that we have. However, a value of 10 to the minus 5 meter, even though that's small, it is within the region of micrometer, which is very easily observable with the tools that we have. So what this is saying is that when we calculate the wavelength of a particle, as the particles get larger, like a tennis ball, that wave property of the particle becomes so insignificant that it really is no longer important to talk about that particle as a wave. However, when you have the object being really, really small, like an electron, the wave property of that particle is actually quite significant and it's measurable. So that's something that I want to emphasize. The properties of objects in the quantum world is only observable when the objects themselves are really, really small. They're not observable when the objects are large. So if you actually apply the Broglie's equation to several types of classical particles going from the Earth which is a huge particle going all the way to electrons, you can see that the de Broglie wavelength for these different objects goes from really, really short to much longer. If you get to the region where the wavelength is 10 to the minus 10 meter or 10 to the minus 4 meters, you can actually observe those wavelengths. We can't measure wavelength of these regions right here because they're so short. So at that point, it doesn't really make sense to call it a wave. It makes more sense to call it a particle. Everything behaves like particle and wave, but in certain contexts, one of those properties is more observable than the other one. Now, next thing is to see if that proposal can be observed, right? So I'm going to talk about a couple of experiments that actually show
show that the electron does have a wave-like property. One of the more famous experiments is this double slit experiment that was originally done on a photon but later on is done on a bunch of particles as well. So this experiment is simple which is to show that if you were to shoot a bunch of particles through a double slit that looks like this what you expect to see is most of the particles is going to bounce back and some of the particles are going to be able to cross through those slits and then if you have a detector on this side then it's going to measure the area where the particles are falling off on and should be just those parts right there right which is parts corresponding to the straight line direction of the slit. For a wave on the other hand you expect this type of behavior and so if you shine light or you have water on this side they're going to form these constructive and destructive interference which is then going to generate these black and white pattern which corresponds to bright and dark regions of the light. The question is you know when you do this with the electron what happens? This was done by two different groups one in the United States and the other one in Britain and the one in the United States was known as the Davis and Germer experiments for the people who conducted the experiment that okay so if the electron is a wave then it should be able to generate a diffraction pattern if we shine on a specific type of crystal that have the same distance in the spacing of the atoms as the wavelength of the electron. So they put a nickel crystal on a pedestal like this and then they shoot the nickel crystal with an electron beam and then they put a detector around that crystal to see what the pattern of that collision would look like. Now again if an electron is a particle it would not generate a diffraction pattern but it turns out that the electron actually generates a standard diffraction pattern that you would expect out of things like x-rays and, and other high energy waves. So this experiment proved that the electron does have wave-like properties and its wavelength can be calculated using de Broglie's equation. So that discovery convinces people that just like light which is a unique type of wave can behave like a particle the electron is a particle that can behave like a wave. As you'll see later on all particles have the wave particle duality. The only reason we don't see it with things that are much bigger like the earth or baseball is that those wavelengths are so short that they're not really measurable and as a result at that point it really makes no sense for us to model the behavior of these objects as waves. So it makes more sense to observe them as particles. De Broglie also proposed that if the electron is a wave then the original Bohr model of the atom that assumes that the electron is a particle that circles the nucleus that that particular model is not quite right. It makes more sense to model the electron as a wave because we now learn that the electron is actually displaying wave-like properties. The type of waves that the electron should be modeled as is something called a standing waves. So a standing wave is also called stationary waves and they're generated when you have two fixed ends and you're moving that wave up and down like this. And if you want to see one of these standing waves you know the easiest example is probably to if you two were to tie a rope on one end and then on the other end you start to move it up and down. In fact there is a YouTube video from UCLA that shows this behavior. What you notice is that the standing wave would form specific patterns that's shown right here. The first pattern you'll see is this. You start moving that rope up and down a little faster. So in other words you try to increase the frequency. The next pattern you'll see is this. And then if you try to increase the frequency a little bit more you start to see this pattern right here and so on. The number of waves that's formed in the standing wave is always an integer number of half wavelengths, right? So this is one half wavelength, this is another half wavelength, right? Because this makes one full wave. And this is one half wavelength, another half wavelength, another half wavelength. So in other words, with these standing waves, they seem to form specific patterns, either one half wavelength, two half wavelengths, three half wavelengths, four half wavelengths, five, six, etc. The points in between here where there is no wave, those are called nodes, N-O-D-E which is the areas of the waves where there is zero amplitude. Now why is this important with respect to the electron? Bohr's model remember relies on the assumption that the electron is restricted to specific positions in the atom, right? That it can't be in these black areas here but it has to be in that specific Bohr orbit. Now Bohr didn't really explain why it has to be in those specific orbits. If a standing wave can only form with a specific number of half 
half wavelength. That means that if you imagine this is the nucleus, you know, the first standing wave can only form if it has a whole number repeats of these half wavelengths. So if you try to bring it a little closer, then it's not going to have a whole number of half wavelengths, in which case you should not be allowed to have the electron in there if the electron is modeled as a standing wave. So the wave model of the electron can immediately explain why the electron has to be quantized. I want to point out too that the electron of course is not a one-dimensional wave like this but it's a three-dimensional wave that notes is areas where the amplitudes are zero. So for a one-dimensional wave like this we can see the notes are in these positions right here. In a two-dimensional wave we can actually also observe it. This is a disk that is moving up and down so it's generating waves like this and what we've done here is sprinkle some sand on the surface of this disk and where the sand lands is the areas where there's not a lot of motion which in other words uh, is to say that the areas where the sand is located is where the nodes of a two-dimensional standing waves is and as you can see for a two-dimensional standing waves the nodes are actually located around the x and y axis as well as this radial positions around the center of the disk this becomes relevant later on when we talk about uh, where electrons are located in atoms this idea of trying to model the electron as a wave in the atom gives rise to another interesting phenomenon which is called the uncertainty principle and the person who discovered this was Heisenberg in classical physics if I have a baseball that's moving it has a definite location as well as a definite speed the electron in this case though is a particle that behaves like a wave so the question is what does it actually look like does it look like a wave or does it look like a particle so there is a famous experiment that was done which is called the double slit experiment and this was something that I've shown you a couple of times before we know that if we just pass the electrons through the double slit we would see this pattern of black light black light black light pattern of the standard interference pattern that we see for any waves so then we know that the electron is behaving like a wave the classical assumption of the electron is that it's a standard particle the question is what does the electron actually look like and how does it generate this interference pattern so if we put detectors on the side of the slits can we see what does the electron look like when it's coming out of the slit so here's the detector the interesting thing is when you did this all of a sudden that whole interference pattern disappeared and what you see is just the standard particle behavior of the electron so you've changed the behavior of the electron by shining light on it and this is what gave rise to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle when you observe something which is what we do every time we try to measure anything we use light to look at it we can't see the behavior of, of any object unless we shine light on it so when we shine light on it we automatically introduce another factor that affects the behavior of that particle for a really large particle it's not really going to be a problem but for a small particle like the electron when you shine light on it it actually changes the behavior of the electron so the way I always use as an analogy is you know how you behave when no one is looking is very different than how you behave in public when everyone is looking and the equation that Heisenberg derived to explain the uncertainty principle is this equation right here which is delta x times m delta u is greater or equal to h over 4 pi the equation here has two different components to it delta x is the uncertainty in the position of a particle delta m times u or sometimes we would use v as well here is the uncertainty in terms of the momentum of the particle we typically take the mass out of the expression because the mass is a constant so it's just so u here represents velocity or sometimes you'll see it as v so the uncertainty of the position times the uncertainty of the velocity has to be at least h over 4 pi or bigger so again what this equation is telling you conceptually is that when you make a measurement you will not be able to get an error in position times the error in velocity that is going to be smaller than this number if you recall Planck's constant is in the order of 10 to the minus 34 so this is a pretty small number it's pretty close to zero so in most measurements the error is not going to be that significant right it's so small that you can ignore it it's not going to affect your conclusion at all but when you start talking about really tiny object then that error becomes very significant as you'll see in this example so here it says that an electron is moving near an atomic nucleus that has a speed of six times ten to the six meter per second plus minus one percent so that plus minus one percent is the uncertainty of the speed measurement the question is what's the uncertainty in its position and then we have a follow-up question about the uncertainty of a baseball so the first thing is to just calculate the uncertainty in the position of the electron we start with Heisenberg's 
equation, which is delta x times m delta u less than or equal to h over 4 pi. So if you think about that expression, the minimum error that you're going to have in any measurement will then be at least h over 4 pi, right? And so that's what's going to help us solve this problem. So what we're going to say is that the product of delta x times m delta u is going to be set to equal h over 4 pi because that's the minimum error. And then once you do that, you can rearrange the equation to solve for delta x, which is going to give you h over 4 pi over m times delta u. And remember, delta u is the uncertainty in the velocity or speed of the object. So we're just going to plug in these numbers. We have 6.626 times 10 to minus 34 joules second. And again, it will be more useful to convert it straight to the SI unit of joules, which is kilogram meter square per second square. So that's what I did here. And then divide that by 4 pi. At the bottom, you have to have the mass of the electron and then the uncertainty with respect to the speed, which is 1% of 6 times 10 to the 6 meter per second, right? Because that's the actual speed. The 1% is the uncertainty. When you do that, you get this number right here, 9.65 times 10 to the minus 10 meter as the uncertainty with respect to the position. So in other words, the position of the electron will be x plus minus this number that you just calculate. Now, what about the baseball? Well, we would repeat that same calculation, except that we would use the mass of the ball and the speed of the ball. So the speed of the ball is 100 miles per hour. So we can convert that to 44.7 meters per second. The uncertainty will just be 1% of 44.7. The mass is 0.142 kilogram. And if you calculate that, you end up getting this number. Now, both of these numbers that we got are very small numbers. So what that's saying is that if you just think about them in absolute terms, you might say, okay, so that means that my error is very small. So that means that I will be able to know the position of my particles very precisely. That is true for the baseball because this number that we just calculated is very small relative to the size of the baseball. The baseball is much bigger than 10 to the minus 34 meters. The diameter of a baseball might be about 10 to the minus 1 meter or 10 to the minus 2 meters. So the size of the baseball is much bigger than that number. So then if that number is so small, that means you pretty much know where your baseball is positioned at. Then you look at that other number, which is for the electron. And this is also a small number. However, it's not that small when you compare it to the size of the electron, because the electron is a very tiny object. So having that number 10 to the minus 10 is actually very large relative to the electron. As information, the radius of a hydrogen atom is 1 times 10 to the minus 10. You see that this number is almost 10 times 10 to the minus 10. So in other words, this uncertainty is 10 times the size of a hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom, of course, is bigger than the electron. So in other words, that uncertainty is 10,000 times the size of the electron. So that means that you really don't know where your electron is if your uncertainty is 10,000 times the size of the object itself. So this highlights the importance of the idea that quantum affects uncertainty principle or the wavelength of a particle is only observed when the objects are really small. When the objects are large, you don't really see these quantum effects.